Good evening, everyone. May God bless you abundantly in the name of the Lord Jesus. As you saw there on the 24th of July, we are going to have this event called From a Wound to a Scar. And I'm here now with one of our pastor's wives who had exactly that same experience. In fact, when you came to the church, you had several, several wounds, right? What wounds did you have and why? Uh, abuse when I was young I was abused by a friend of my mother uh, also my mom I didn't have a good relationship with her I grew up without my mom's love because she had the thoughts to kill me so she was always very distant from me um, so I had that rejection I also had the rejection from my biological dad that I remember my mom saying that he told her that if it was up to him me and her would live under the bridge so my whole family always rejected us so I had different types of wounds related to that and, and what did that make you think like for the future did you did that cause some kind of trauma towards like uh, certain situations in life in the future of course I had a lot of pain inside of me you know I had a lot of hatred inside of me I had suicidal thoughts I was very depressed my depression was so heavy that I used to hit myself to try to take away the pain that I had inside of me I tried to kill myself I was I was broken and because of that I would always try to hurt people as well because even in school I would always get involved with fights because of that pain that I had inside of me I, I had to release that in someone you, you would uh, release that anger on your mom as well? Yes, many times, but then things would just get worse in the house. You know, this is one of the points with, uh, with wounds. And actually today, just for us to finalize here, today you are free from all of that, yes. right? You're happily married. Yes. You've been married to Pastor Gladson here for how long? Six years. Six years. Yeah. Your relationship with your parents is good? Yes. We are, me and my mom now, we are best friends. No more wounds, just some old scars. Exactly. I'm healed. You know, the, the thing, we were talking about this today. The thing about wounds is that if you have a wound that is not healed, there's a very big chance that you're going to inflict that same wound on someone else. How many times people say, they see, for example, the father cheating and they say, the young man says, when I grow up, I'm never going to do what my dad did. I'm never going to cheat on my future wife. But they do exactly that. The Bible tells us in, uh, in the book of Genesis about an example of Dinah. Dinah was raped. Following her rape, that wound that she had, her brothers, her whole family became enraged so that that wound affected the whole family. And as a consequence, they went, some of her brothers went and killed all the men in, in, a, in a city where she was raped before. All the men were killed, families destroyed, women taken captives, or, or they were taken perhaps to be looked after, but after, after having their husbands killed. One wound called, caused many other wounds, which in return caused, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of wounds of the people in that city who were affected. Unless a wound is treated, this is what happens. The cycle repeats itself. And so, if you are watching me now and you have a wound that has never been healed, that you've never dealt with, perhaps you go to church and you pretend that everything is fine, but you know something's not right, then on Sunday the 24th, on this event at 3 p.m., from a wound to a scar, uh, uh, sorry, not 2, 3 p.m., 2.30 p.m., you will have a chance to fix this problem. The Lord Jesus is going to fix this problem for you. And if you know someone who has a problem similar to this because of abuse, whatever it is, invite that person to come with you on that Sunday, the 24th of July in the afternoon. We're going now to watch a testimony of the campaign of Israel, someone who went to the altar and changed the history of his life. Let's watch his testimony now. Because of the broken home that I grew up in, I had to deal with gangs, criminal activity, depression, feeling low, suicidal thoughts, literally having nothing, to the point that I could have lost my life, to the point I felt like I had nothing, I was at breaking point. 
before everything was it was completely messed up for me growing up in a household where you know my mom was a drug addict she you know would be at home and i'd hear different guys coming into the house disrespecting my mom and from a young age five six i was hearing the guys and my mom and i felt helpless sometimes they'll beat her up and that's what i grew up seeing and my real dad, my biological dad, he beat up my mum when I was very young, like three, le left her to die. So I grew up with a lot of questions, you know, a lot of anger. That's what's all within my house. So we grew up with nothing. You know how sometimes people have things at home, they can go and eat dinner. I didn't have this. I'd go and empty cupboards. I'd go weeks without eating. Sometimes it would literally be bare minimum or my mum would go and spend it on alcohol rather than feeding us. I remember one time I had football training. My mum couldn't afford for me to go and I got so low. I was only about eight or nine and had thoughts about jumping out of the window. So my mom put me into that, tried to so solve the issue with counseling. And that was already from 10, 11. So I thought, grew up something was wrong with me. Tried to get me anger management because sometimes I'll just lash out from when I was very young. Cause I had a lot of questions and I didn't know what was going on. And leading into this like 13, 14, because I was very good at football, I started to mingle with the wrong crowd. People were older than me. And then I started to do things because I needed money because I had nothing at home. So I started to, to rob people, rob a phone out of someone's bag during PE. But then it started to get worse and worse. You know, age of 14, I was in court. I had four robberies and an assault that I got charged for. I went to, you know, youth offenders. And there again, they tried to help me, tried to help me. I was there for about nine months and they were trying to help me, but nothing was helping. After that, I even got worse. So I got heavily involved into gangs. I'd always have a weapon on me, knives. Everything was non-stop. I started to go out to the countryside now, traveling hours just to sell drugs, you know, and I became very heartless because if no one cared about me when I was so young, I'd, I couldn't care less about anyone. There was times that I would see mums, mums having their kids, but I wouldn't care if I would sell hard drugs to them. I just, nothing really phased me. I just wanted to get money and do what needed to be done. And then because of everything that I was doing, and I was, you know, scamming people. People ended up coming, you know, rival gangs, you know, they came and they attacked my family, my mum while my brothers were in the house. And I was after them, it was a back and forth, back and forth until, you know, the police basically gave me ultimatums. Either, you know, you go to prison or you move areas out to Essex. So I moved out to Essex and then I didn't have the gangs, I didn't have the girls and I fell into a very deep depression where I remember times I was trying to take tablets. My mum had to barge in my room to, you know, to save my life. The time was coming, I was coming off a tag and I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, I feel so alone, I feel so depressed. and. No one understands me, I've tried everything. And my own mom used to say by 18, I'll be dead or in prison, you know? So for me, I had no hope. I had nothing that I could do, do in life. I started to do a lot more suicidal thoughts, a lot of things internal, because a lot of things are outside on mask I'd be at parties, but the things I was facing inside, I didn't know how to express it. I didn't have a family, I didn't have a father figure. And I felt like in my house, I had to be the man because I had younger siblings, so I had to provide. to so put me into a corner, and to the point that literally I came off tag, um, and that's literally when I got invited to, to, to come to the, to, the, to the UCKG. I was seeking for an answer because for so long I had this void, this emptiness inside of me. And I tried to mask it, you know, go into different altars. Literally, I tried everything, money, everything that the outside has to offer, fame. I had, there was times when my closest friends, you know, they were famous. I thought I'd be with them. And I was trying to do things by myself, girls, trying to have, literally, not, I couldn't be by myself. So I was trying to find this happiness I was looking for everywhere, whether it be counseling, whether it be, youth offenders. I was trying to find that solution I was looking for for so long at different altars, but I just still couldn't find it. I started coming to the UCKG and a lot of things stood out for me. But one thing that I couldn't believe is that people that were worse off than me, people that have gone through what I went through, I could see that they had changed. There was an installment of faith installed inside of me that I felt like, wow, I can change my life. And once I believed in that, that's when everything just started to change and I found the altar. I didn't need people to tell me what to do, but literally I started to sacrifice. It was hard. I'm not, I'm not here to say it was easy because these are things I was doing for years of my life, like years of selling drugs, years of, you know, addictions, everything that I was doing for years. So when I heard that I had to sacrifice, it hurt me. It hurt me, but if the solution that I wanted is there, I'm gonna get it with everything. The same way out there, I was aggressive. I said, if I need to put my life 100% on here, that's what I'm gonna do. When I first heard about the campaign, when I was first in the church, I didn't do it. For me, it didn't make sense at first because it was like, I'm losing things. So I didn't believe in it. So I just thought, why am I, why am I gonna do it? But then God kept speaking to me. God kept speaking to me, you need to sacrifice. And there's things that you know in your head that you need to sacrifice, but money was my everything. If I, I grew up with no money, why am I gonna give this money up? Then it started, I remember my, 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 first, my first campaign, it was like a challenge. I remember I had nothing because I was homeless, I was unemployed. And I remember I came, I came to the service. I had no intentions of, of being involved in a campaign. And then God spoke to me, I remember I had, I had a Xbox game and basically I had to sell this Xbox game. And I remember I was unemployed for like two years. And, and I had to sell this game 
after the service to basically to provide dinner for my family and God was asking me for it and I was just like this is dinner for my family my mom's gonna kill me but then I, I went and done it this is the first ever campaign and it was only something like 12 pounds done it put it on oats and for years years of no's 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 I believe it was the next month I got a job in the city someone with a criminal record and that's when I was in I was in this career for like four years that's when I was able you know to buy my house I thought wow so that already I was already seeing it and then the next campaign after campaign after, I dived in, I dived in. And I remember when it came to, you know, the most important campaign, it got to a point I was sacrificing physically and, okay, I was achieving things, but I wanted a total change in my life inside. And God was asking me for something, you know, spiritually. And it was something that, something hidden that I never revealed to anyone. And God was asking me to confess it, to, to open up about it. And I remember, I was like, God, surely this can't be. I'll, I'll give, I'll give every, I'll give anything. I'll give every, I'll give my phone, whatever that you need. But God was like, humble yourself and confess. I went to the pastor and I was crying. And even the pastor was looking at me like, why are you crying? And all the thoughts were coming. And something that I did in my past, I confessed it. And literally after that, a space of two, three weeks, I received the Holy Spirit. I went to God with boldness. Like, God, I've sacrificed now. Like, I've humbled myself. I don't care what man has to say. I've done what I need to do. I had this confidence and conviction inside of me. And then literally God worked and everything changed. I've done the physical, but I've done the spiritual. Now finally, I ticked it off. And I literally, it's like I jumped off a building and said, God, catch me. That's, what, that's how I felt. My life completely changed in all areas of my life. I mean, firstly, within myself, I suffered deep depression. There's nothing but happiness. I go through my problems. Like I have problems that try to pop up, things that try to stress me, but you'll never see me have a down day or I need to result in anything. My strength comes from the old time. I'm a man of faith. That's what I've seen a big difference in myself. In my whole family, sometimes things happen. They look to me and just the way I am gives confidence to my family. My mom's like my best friend. My little brothers look to me and say, Mark, I want to be like you when I'm older. Jobs were kicking me out because of my criminal record. I have a career where I was able to buy my house. I know I became a manager. You know, now I'm helping the work of God, which is amazing. Everything's transformed. You know, love life. Whereas before I used to sleeping around, now I'm working to get married. Like everything's transformed and it's not, it's not a thing where I can, one area of my life, someone can say, but where's God here? God's able to do a work. Because I focus on the most important, that we've got to seek first the kingdom of God, everything will be added to you. I seek the kingdom of God. I didn't care about everything else. And God's just been adding without me even asking. You know, on Monday, we sat in a meeting in Scotland Yard with some police officers and Mark was sitting in that meeting. We were planning how we can work with the police to make our communities better, to also to help develop the work of the church. And Mark was sitting there at the table with some top officers there in Scotland Yard. And I asked him, Mark, if, if this were some years ago, could you ever imagine yourself sitting here surrounded by police officers? He said, never, Bishop. In fact, he even shared this testimony there um, a, 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 among those police officers. And you see that the transformation that the altar causes in the life of a person who surrenders themselves on the altar is beyond what anybody can explain or imagine. You know, people say all the time in this world, oh, I'm a regenerated offender. I'm a, a regenerated womanizer. I'm a regenerated drug user. But are they really? In reality, what usually happens, what usually tends to happen when a person doesn't have God is that they just swap that vice, that problem, for something else. But when a person goes to the altar, surrenders themselves on the altar, without any kind of, uh, of safety net, and says, here I am, my God, then because the surrender was total, the transformation is also total. You know, perhaps on Sunday, you, I know we have people who went to the altar on Sunday with their all. But I also believe that there are those that you went to the altar and you said, well, I, I'm, I think I need 
to think twice because if something happens, I need, uh, you know, I need some kind of backup. I need some kind of, maybe you were not left completely in the dependence of God. And I'm not just talking about the financial side because maybe you know that the people who surround you are, are destructive for your life and you, you cut many of them out, but you left one or two. That's a backup. Maybe you abandoned some of your vices, but there's one you didn't because you, you think I need something that can give me some kind of joy in this life. I know this is wrong. I, I quit and often, I have Pastor uh, Anderson here with me. Often people say to us, but Bishop, I, I quit almost everything that was wrong. Bishop, I quit all of my bad friends. Bishop, I quit almost all of the things that are wrong. Almost all. That's the problem. Understand that if it's not a total surrender, then it's not a surrender at all. You, you surely would not accept that you are about to get married with someone and you allow the person, the man you are about to get married, to keep one of his ex, exes as a backup. You would never allow that. You would say, no, I don't want you like this. It's all or nothing. And with God is the same. So when you went to the altar, did you put all of your life there? Because we can't call it a sacrifice, Pastor Anderson. We can't call it a sacrifice. We can't call it a surrender unless it's total. And the transformation the Holy Spirit wants to do, Bishop, it starts from the inside out. Sometimes people want their life to change, but they think, if I resolve this problem in my marriage, in my health, in my finances, then my life changes. But what they don't understand is that first the fire comes on the inside. Once there is a real transformation on the inside, naturally the outside is going to change. But the Holy Spirit can only come when the sacrifice is total, is complete on the altar. Total. And listen, it, this goes both ways. Because maybe you say, Bishop, my sacrifice on the altar on Sunday, financially, was total. But was it total inside here? Was it total on your lifestyle? Or you are keeping some things as a backup. You know, we go to the altar because the altar is a reminder that there is someone above us who is far greater than we are. If we don't understand this, then we stop going to the altar. We stop going to the altar because we stop recognizing that God is above us. On Sunday will be the Sunday of the cloud of testimonies. And we know, like I said yesterday in the program, we know that the, the, the testimony, some testimonies, they're not going to happen in a week. Yesterday we had the testimony of the lady who got married and so on. It didn't happen in a week. We have to be realistic. But the fire of God inside of you has to come upon your life, has to enter inside of you already now. If you did this campaign for you to be born of God, maybe you are tired of who you are. I want to speak to you now that you say like this, Bishop, I'm in the church. I say to everyone that I have the Holy Spirit, but you are full of rage. You say to everyone you have the Holy Spirit, but God forbid someone gets you on a bad day because maybe if you wake up on a good day, it's lovely to be around you. But if someone gets you on a bad day, you know, you, you, there's fire coming from every direction because people can't even talk to you for a moment. What kind of Holy Spirit is that? What kind of Holy Spirit makes a person to be up and down, doubtful about whether God is with them or not? Maybe this is the fire that needs to come inside of you that hasn't happened yet. But this is something that can happen already by Sunday. Tomorrow when you go to the service, we're going to take time tomorrow for us to seek the Holy Spirit.
And tomorrow already you can receive the Holy Spirit. So Sunday you have your testimony. Or whatever it is, if you took part of the campaign for something else, and it's something that can happen now, Sunday now will be the Sunday of the cloud of testimonies. And I'm sure that there are many people who already they have that testimony. Maybe you're watching me now and you are shouting at your screen, Bishop, my, I have my testimony already. So Sunday, we want to hear from you. We're going to join our faith right now. We have the pastors and the wives here with us. We also have the pastors from the churches outside London connected with us in the same faith. So now let's talk to God. We have here the requests of our church in Finsbury Park. Pastor Anderson has the ones from, from, from Hammersmith. The pastors have the requests here of their churches. Let's now talk to God. Let's talk to God. It's time to pray. My Lord, when it came to saving us, you didn't hold back. You didn't give half of your son or an angel in replacement of your son. You gave the only begotten son that you had in, its, in his fullness, my Lord. And you expect nothing else than the same from us. You expect us also, my God, to place on the altar nothing less than our whole life. And I know that our fears many times, they play in our mind. Our fears many times, they try, my Lord, to scare us away from the altar. To scare us away from placing our all, our whole life on the altar. How many people, my Lord, they know that they've given almost all of their life, but they also know that there's something, someone, there's something inside of them that they haven't given. But my God, until the end of this month, this person will have the privilege to climb the altar. Even tomorrow when they come to the church, so that Sunday when they come, there is nothing that they haven't surrendered yet. So now, my Lord, I pray, see this person that with a lot of effort, see this person that with a lot of, of, of pushing themselves, they have decided, my God, to no longer hold anything back, to no longer delay in their surrender to you, my God. And just like they didn't delay, they decided not to delay their surrender to you, my Lord, let your fire not delay in coming upon them. This person who said, no, what I did on Sunday was not my all, but tomorrow, this Sunday, it will be my all there because I can't go, I can't have the pastors, the bishops going to Mount Carmel and call upon God for the fire to come down knowing that I didn't do my all. No, my Lord, that can't happen. It has to be our all, our whole life, our thoughts, our, our urges, our altars, my God. That's right. If this person knocked down all, my Lord, almost all the altars, but one was standing, two were standing, let the faith of this person knock down those altars, my Lord, so they can say, I have surrendered my all to my God. My Father, here now we present to you the requests of the people there from Finsbury Park from the Portuguese service, the English service, the Spanish service. I present to you now the request of all the churches, of the pastors that are represented here with me tonight. Those pastors who are connected in their respective churches, my Lord, there by the altar of their churches. I pray, be with them, my Lord, and let every altar of the UCKG in this country, my Lord, of Great Britain, that 
there will be a queue of testimonies on each one of our altars even Finsbury Park that has perhaps the, the largest altar here in the UK even the altar in Finsbury Park will be small compared to the number of testimonies that will come we bless your people right now my Lord in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen praise God Amen Amen this is what we believe the altar of the church in Finsbury Park the altar of your church will be small for the number of testimonies that will be there and you will be one of them but remember remember in order for me to be at peace with my sacrifice I have to know that I left my whole life there on the altar if you haven't done that yet you have the chance to do that tomorrow or Sunday but don't delay so that the fire of God can come down tomorrow I'll be in one more altar of another UCKG I'll see you tomorrow don't break your chain of prayer of Jericho we'll be there in Findry Park in the evening with you until then God bless you bye bye Be Inspired Special. Be Inspired Special. On the way to Mount Carmel. Be Inspired Special. On the way to Mount Carmel. Five signs that there is a wound in your soul. You have grudges against one or several people and you try to avoid them. You do not want to deal with matters from the past so you can ignore your memories and bad feelings. You hurt other people, even those you love, and are not to blame for your pain. You have given up on your dreams. Before, you were positive and optimistic. Today, you only think about surviving. You isolate yourself from others because any contact can become suffocating for you or for them. Your soul is wounded, however, there is a remedy. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. 
From a wound to a scar, an event that can heal your soul and turn your wound into a great story of resilience. On Sunday, 24th July at 2.30 p.m. at 232 Seven Sisters Road, Finsbury Park, London, N43NX or at selected Universal Church locations. Call us on 020-7686-6000 for more details or check out our website 